Father, we come in today, uh, study to your hands and all those who have come to on, on Zoom, Father, and all those who are planning to come, uh, pray that they will all join together and we will have a very fruitful session today, Father. Pray that the Spirit of uh, God would uh, enlighten our hearts to see the, the beauty of your, your love, your grace <coughs> in your word. Father, even as we study the conflict we have uh, against in us, uh, help us have the assurance that we promise to us, Father. Give us understanding and help us apply all that we learn in our lives. We commit uh, this fellowship into your hands. We pray that you will sustain us if it is your will, so that we will, we will grow in your knowledge. We will be sanctified in learning your word. All this we ask in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So, uh, once again, good evening and welcome. Probably this will be the last uh, session on Romans 7. So we took three sessions and this is the third. Today we'll uh, learn from verses 14 through to verse 10. That is till the end of uh, Romans 7. And as an introduction, I would like to go uh, into some of the things that we have learned last week, especially uh, we have learned, we have, we have sketched through um, how Paul was teaching uh, the law right from chapter 3 onwards. Paul's exposition on the law from 3 onwards. We learned what the law cannot do for us. The law cannot justify us. Paul was teaching what the law cannot do with us. The law sanctify us. We learned that in chapter 6. Paul taught what the law cannot do to us. We learned that in Romans chapter 7, verse 1 to 6. The first session on Romans 7. The law cannot condemn us. So the cannot justify us, the cannot sanctify us. The law cannot condemn us. Last week, from verse 7 to verse 13, we learned what the law can do for us. What was that? The law can convict us of our sin. The law gives us the knowledge of our sin. It opens our eyes. What the law cannot do in us, that is what we are going to learn today. What the law cannot do in us. Namely, or cannot deliver us the indwelling sin that is in us. Romans 7, 18 to 25. And finally, probably God willing, next week, Romans 8, 1 to 4, we will learn what the law can do, how God fulfills that as we walk in the Spirit, the law being fulfilled in us. Shall we read um, today's uh, text, verses 14? To 25 of Romans chapter 7. For we know the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 18, For I know nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, evil I do not want, is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 21. So I find it to be a law when I want to do right, 
evil lies close at hand for i delight in delight in the law of god in my inner being but i see in my members another law war against the law of my, of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of death thanks be to god through jesus our lord so then i myself serve of god with my mind but with my flesh i serve the law of sin that was the text for today we have a little bit more of introduction coming as we have been doing lately initially we saw how paul was teaching uh, paul's teaching regarding the law now let's go back um, to romans chapter uh, verse 1 on right through and 7 verse 6 you know we learned we are a new creation we have i don't want the i, I don't want the verses now we learned we are a new redeem we have a new redeemed self we have a new nature we are no more slaves we are uh, we have freedom from the mastery of sin in roman 7 we learned we are dead to the law and all these these three things uh, the new nature freedom from the mastery of sin and being dead to the law are are realities in us realities about us in christ all the all these three happened decisively irreversibly unchangeably absolutely irrevocably whatever you call it that is the reality of a believer in christ but if you notice that paul never thought that yes having having said all this now a believer is no no more going to be sinning no paul has not taught something like that paul has never taught that we will be from all sinning once justified nor uh, has paul taught that you know a justified person will will grow into a level of sanctification and thereafter he will he will no more sin no even paul has not taught that that is one teaching that has been prevalent that uh, after conversion we grow in sanctification and there is a second unction of the holy spirit and thereafter we will be fully sanctified perfectly sanctified and we will not sin and the people who hold on to that unbiblical view they they claim that romans 7 verse 14 to 25 is paul's pre conversion experience but when we study this text today we will clearly understand this is paul talking about himself as a believer in fact as a mature christian so rather uh, paul is giving we, uh, when we look into roman 6 even though it is it is full of teachings like you are a new creation uh, you are no more slave you know there are verses that that uh, indicate roman 7 in roman 6 uh, verses like 12 and 13 shall we read roman 6 verse 12 and 13 um roman 6 verse 10 13 paul says let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body you obey its passions you know paul has just said that you are a new creation and the old is dead you are dead to sin but then paul says gives a warning do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies and make it make you obey its passions verse 13 do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness so paul is indicating a, the possibility that we tend our members to sin and paul is giving a strong warning in chapter which sounds like a very victorious chapter and paul is actually giving a hint of what is to come in romans chapter 7 and in romans chapter 7 and in fact in in first timothy was 115 when paul says i am the chief of all sinners you know paul is writing that because paul is writing from his experience as a christian where he has this con- conflict with the sin in him and in romans 7 verse 14 to 25 as we have read 
so paul is uh, explaining this this reality of a christian this reality of already but not yet i want all of us to keep this in mind you know this is a christian reality that is applicable to a lot of factors already but not yet already we are victorious in christ we are a new creation already decisively unchangeably irrevocable we are no more slaves we are victorious we are new creation but not yet perfectly and fully in an experiential way already but not yet that is the reality in which we live in this present uh, in this phase of our christian journey and that is what paul is describing in romans 7 verse 14 to 25 and the reason is, is the indwelling sin the flesh the fleshiness that remains in us okay also we need to look into the change of tense i think i have mentioned that last week uh, verses 7 to 13 this is all in past and verse 14 onwards the tense changes to uh, the present tense so in romans uh, 7 to 14 paul is in fact looking back into his uh, conversion experience where he is describing that the law is a good that was paul's agenda in the last no law is not the reason of all the death and sin that is there this the culprit is sin that is what we have learned and to make that point paul is uh, using his own experience in his past when he came to christ the law enabled him to see his own sinfulness so that was in the past tense now he is describing the present conflict of a christian and he is again using his own life experience and he writes it in the present tense again that is a major uh, argument against the the wrong teaching that this is the conversion experience of paul so there are a lot of this 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 section of roman 7 verse 14 to 25 uh, is a very uh, controversial one in the sense uh, i think when we study it in the context and when we rightly understand it there is no confusion there but sadly there are misunderstandings on, on regarding that portion there there are people who say that paul is looking back and talking about conversion days but there are verses that clearly suggest believer cannot think like that and there are people who say that this is the converted paul but the carnal paul you know they create an artificial category of carnal christians which is totally unbiblical there are a lot of uh, uh bible teachers that hold on to that you know you you are a sinner then you become christian then you then there is a period of christianity no if you are carnal non christian simple bible doesn't have a category of carnal christian and then you have this uh, special anointing of the holy spirit the second filling of the holy spirit as they call which is unbiblical and they say you reach a perfect level of sanctification so they write they say this section of roman 7 is the carnal christian paul talking but uh i believe that is unbiblical and let's move forward so that that is the argument tense in this text moving on um, there are three major arguments paul is uh, bringing out in this text verse 14 to 25 the first thing the first point is uh, again a continuation of paul, paul has been describing paul is continuing to argue for the goodness of the law you know verse 14 paul said the law is good righteous holy and now paul further continues uh, last week we learned when paul was saying the law is good in that it brings it gives us the conviction um and in verse 14 to 25 it, paul is uh, through the illustration of this conflict paul is also continuing his uh, argument for the goodness of the law experience you know he he gives a personal account of the law verse 14 paul says the law is spiritual verse 16 paul says i agree with the law that it is good verse 22 he says i delight in the law of god verse 25 he says i serve the law with my mind. so paul is again in that theme of uh teaching that the law is good and the culprit is sin 
So that is the first thing, uh, not the major uh, theme of the chapter. The second aspect is probably the, the, the most important theme of this section. Paul argues for the reality of the indwelling sin that remains in a justified person. A justified sinner, that is a Christian of God, will suspect of the flesh remaining in him. And Paul calls that the indwelling sin, the sin, the sin that dwells in me. 17, 20, 23. Paul is talking about this, the reality of the indwelling sin. So that is the second main theme. In fact, the most important theme. And the third uh, argument of Paul in this section is, Paul argues that a Christian is not only by the indwelling sin. The indwelling sin is not what, is not that defined Christian. But there is a, a reality that is much deeper and uh, solid, this reality of indwelling sin. A reality that a Christian is a new creation. A Christian is a person who delights in the law of God. A Christian is a person who agrees with the law of God. So these are, these are verses that clearly proves that this section is talking about a believer and not an unbeliever. Uh, we learned that in the, in the, in the as we verses. And Paul is saying, in Christ you are already uh, decisively, unchangeably perfect, free from sin. But at the same time, you have this conflict with the remaining sin in you, the indwelling sin in you. And that is the essence of this chapter, the three major arguments section. And before, finally, quick before going to, through the verses uh, proper, uh, I want you to appreciate the tone of this section. You know, this, this section, verse 14 to 25, is in fact Paul's desperate cry. It's a desperate cry of, uh, it's a cry of a desperate man. You know, there are three laments, each having three parts. You know, uh, each uh, beginning, the first beginning, um, from verse 14 through to verse 17 is the first lament. It has three parts. Then the second lament of Paul. The first one starts with the word for. The second again with the word for. Lament of Paul. And third one beginning in verse 21. Similarly beginning with the word so. And verse 24 is the, is the culmination of all those cries. Oh, wretched man that I am. And what are the three parts of these laments? Three cries from Paul's desperate heart, each having us. It begins by Paul describing the condition of his heart, the problem of that is under discussion, the problem that he is facing. Then Paul goes, uh, Paul goes on to explain the proof of that condition. You know, why is he saying that that is his condition? Then finally he gives the reason of this condition, the source of this condition, the cause of this condition. Um, and again, because it is beginning with the word for, we can be sure that continuation of what Paul has been teaching. So with that in background, uh, let's move into the verses. Three laments, each having three, three parts. So the first uh, lament is verse 14 to 17. Shall we read that? Verse 14 to 17. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Uh, can we have the verses there on the screen itself? The three parts of this lament. Verse 14, Paul describes the condition of his heart. So he, he, he bridges this section by saying 
the law is spiritual. I've been continuing to ex, uh, explain that the law is good. And, and he, contrasts his, he contrasts it with his, his own life. He says, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. So verse 14, second half, Paul describes his condition and his cry. I am of the flesh under sin. Verse 15 and 16 gives the proof of that condition. Why is Paul saying that I am, I am uh, of the flesh sold under sin? What is the reason? I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very things I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So Paul is having this conflict. He's unable to do what he loves to do, what he longs to do. And that is the proof. This is my condition. And finally, in verse 17, Paul describes the reason, the basic reason. Why is this so? Verse 17 begins by the word so. Now it is not I who do it, but the sin, but sin that dwells within me. Okay. Coming back, let's let's learn that a little bit more in detail. Uh, the, the verses may be taken uh, away from the screen. So Paul says, the law is spiritual. In the last sections, the last uh, portions of Romans 7, we have learned Paul teaching that the law is good, the law is holy. Verse 12, where the law is righteous. Um, and Paul is continuing that. And he says, he contrasts it by saying, but, but I am of the flesh. I am sold under sin. You know, this one verse is used by those uh, people who teach that Paul is not a believer. You know, Paul is talking about pre-conversion. How can a believer, how can a, a regenerate Paul say that he is of the flesh or he is sold under sin? Because in Romans 6, he has just taught that we are free from sin. But I want uh, you to understand that this, this is like Paul saying, I am the chief of all the sinners. That is not a technical statement. You know, Paul is not measuring all the sins of all the people. And he is now giving the verdict, I am chief of sinners. No, it is a perspective of Paul that is being displayed. Similarly, Paul is saying, oh, I am of the flesh. I'm, it's like I am sold under sin. You know, I am fed up of this. I'm sold under sin. And in verse, the proof is in verse 17, he moves from the, the perspective uh, language to the technical language. Verse 17, he says, Now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. It is no, no, it is no longer I'm the flesh, it, the sin that is in me. It is no longer I who is sold under sin, but it is the sin that is in me. And what is the reason? Let's look into verse 15 and 16. Paul's reason, Paul's proof in, 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 that, uh, in that verse, in, in putting that verse 14 like that. Paul says, I do not do what I want to do. But I do certain things I don't want to do. Let's look at uh, three phrases. Paul want to do certain things. I hate to do certain things. So in fact, what, is, what Paul is saying is, uh, you know, I love to do certain things. I hate to do certain things, all in agreement with the law. But I don't have the ability to do that. Somehow I'm not able to do the way I want to. And Paul says, what is the reason? It is, the reason is no longer I, but the sin that dwells in me. Go back again to verse 14. Let's dwell on the word flesh for a moment. You know, Paul says, I am of the flesh. You know, the word flesh is used uh, in, this, in the New Testament in two ways. You know, first, uh, it is used in a new amoral way. And not, an, not in the immoral way, but the amoral way. In a neutral way. Uh, you know, when, when, the, when, when New Testament says in John chapter 1, the word became flesh. But now, as we are in Christ, once we are in Christ, you know, our nature, our, the core of our being, the real us is not defined by flesh. It is made new. It is a new creation. But the fleshiness remains in us. 
you know we carry over the humanness the unredeemed humanness that we had we have been living for years with us and also let us not uh, think that flesh the word flesh means the physical body no it is not restricted to the physical body it it, it indicates the uh, i would like the phrase i would love the best i mean the most to to describe that is fallen you know that fallenness is there in the flesh it is there in our thinking it is there in our emotions so it is not in our in our physical body but rather the fleshiness the remnant of the flesh is the, is is coloring or is uh, scenting the whole of our being but remember the core of our being the s not flesh we are a new creation i hope uh, uh, you are getting it the s is not defined by flesh but the fleshiness remains that is why paul is saying it is no longer i who do it the i in me is free of all this is a new creation but this flesh is remaining and that flesh is causing me to do this the real i the proof of what is the proof of this real i that he loves to do certain in agreement with the law he do certain things in agreement with the law you know that comes only from generated person an unbeliever cannot do that so the real me longs to do the so those things the real needs to do those things but the sin is still dwelling in me and i am not able to do that the the way i want to so that is the first uh, lament is that clear can i move forward yes so the second la uh, comes from verse is from verse 18 uh, 19 and 20 was 18 to 20 and before going uh, into that i want uh, all of us to look into this word and this phrase in verse 17 paul is saying it is no longer i uh, let's think about the phrase no longer i what does that indicate that means i once upon a time it was i doing all this it it is not i right now that is a clear proof that this is the believer paul talking or else there is no uh, meaning in the word no longer i when paul says it is no longer i he is saying he is saying once it was i and no longer it is i are you getting that again and a strong evidence that paul this is paul talking about the reality of uh, himself as a believer okay verse 18 onwards verse 18 to 20 the second lament for i know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh for i have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out for i do not do what i want but the evil i do not want is what i keep on doing now if i do what i do not want it is no longer who do it but that dwells within me again very similar to the previous structure again three parts was 18 to 20 is the second lament the first part is the paul describing the cut was 18 for i know that nothing good dwells in me again perspective paul is saying it is not that paul is technically saying there is nothing good in me no paul has the holy spirit paul is a new creation all those things are there but he is it's all about perspective as i previously said just like paul is the chief of all sinners he is saying nothing good dwells in me then he becomes technical that is in my flesh for i have the desire to do what is but not the ability to carry it out and and that is was 18 second half and was 19 paul is describing the proof of the condition i do not do the good i want that means hey, deep in me the me wants to do good but do but i do not do deep inside i do not want to do the evil but i keep on doing that 
and verse 20 the reason the source the basis of what is happening why is this happening now if i do what i do not want it is no longer i who do it but sin that dwells within me so are you able to appreciate uh, uh, the parallel between the first, first three 14 to 17 and 18 to 20 second lament and the first lament is almost the same moving on to the third lament verse 21 to verse 23 verse 21 describes the condition verse 21 so i find it to be a law that when i want to do right even close at hand that is paul describing his condition you know when i want to do something evil is so close to me evil is evil lies close at hand and verse 22 and 23 the proof of the condition and the reason for the condition paul is uh, mixing it up together for i delight in the law of god in my inner being but i see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive the law of sin that dwells in my members let me read read that again verse 2 for i delight in the law of god where in my inner being but what law? verse 23 but i see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members so that is the proof of the condition and the cause of the condition all mixed up and paul is saying paul is saying you know deep in me there is this principle there is this law that makes me makes me desire god's word makes me delight in god's word but there is another principle working in me not simply working waging war so there is a conflict there the conflict is between the law of god in the inner being paul also calls it the law of the in conflict with the law of sin waging war in the members so this flesh in conflict with the law of God, the principle that uh, the law of God, the principle uh, that helps, that makes Paul delight in God's law. You know, Paul has been laboring to explain this one point thrice using three sets of lament. Are we able to apply that? I want to, uh, there are two illustrations which uh, I, I love. Uh, these are not created by me i've read from elsewhere uh, you know that will help us understand the 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 death that paul is undergoing uh, and through it we need to realize we need to check we need to search our hearts do we share that conflict in in, in our lives um, think about a painter you know this painter uh, this being he has this beautiful vision of all the colors and glory and all the, the universe you know he has all the color concepts in place uh, he has all the shades and the theories and the everything in place but he doesn't have the skill to put it on canvas there is something in him that is preventing in 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 putting it in drawing in sketch in paints giving flesh to it so he takes his uh, color, tries to draw that beautiful mountain in his, probably in his mind. And what comes out is far from beautiful. And, and he has this, con this, he knows what it is, what has to be done, he knows. But he is unable to do that. You know, that is the conflict. You know, Paul, when Paul says he is, he, he doesn't have the ability to do it, he doesn't, he, he's not saying that, uh, nothing he is not doing any good at all no what paul is saying you know when i look into god's law delight in god's you know my whole horizon of beauty and blessings and i am unable to keep up with that and that is paul's struggle because this the sin is still not i am not totally free from sin uh, another um, 
illustration would be you know once a preacher was um, once this uh, this preacher was famous for his preaching he, he continuously preaches on sin the weight of sin and the heaviness of sin and this uh, this unbeliever group comes to this preacher and says him hey, keep on preaching about the weight of sin i don't feel any weight what are you talking about is as your sin 5 kg in weight or or 10 kg or 100 kg or 200 kg what are you talking about and the the preacher paused for a minute and he said you know you take a 500 kg weight and put it on top of a dead man the dead will not feel any weight and it is because we are alive we have this new creation we feel this conflict we feel the weight of sin and shall we read sam 19 verse 104 sam 119 verse 104 through your precepts i get understanding therefore i hate every false way you know this is exactly what we see in you know, he delights in god god's precepts and so he has certain things but the problem is he is unable to do those things yani he is unable to live up to what he longs for so this conflict is is very real let me uh, let me encourage all of us to look into our own lives do we have this conflict in us and this is the mark of a genuine christian this conflict this conflict between the new creation the renewed you the real me the true me the basic me in me the, the core me in me that hates sin and loves righteousness the conflict is with this remaining humanness this fleshiness that remains in us and and practically you know this this conflict comes when we come face to face with temptations you know we have this war in us and not only before uh, not only when we face temptations in case we fail and we sin conflict will continue in the form of our, the guilt we have in the form of the pain we have the sorrow we have you know bible talks about right heart this is the mark of a believer and paul is sharing this and this is not even the so called carnal believer there is nothing like that but not even a, a premature or or a uh, or an immature believer this is the mature paul talking share this conflict in our do we have this conflict this this hatred and love and the struggle all mixed up together all in agreement with god's word as we see in uh, verses 14 to 18 quickly before going to verse 24 uh, let's uh, look into verse 18 the second half it says for i have the desire to do what is right but no ability to carry out you know uh, Paul is saying, "I don't have the ability to carry out." Does it mean a uh, believer always fails in his in his fight against sin, or a believer always uh, fails in his fight for righteousness? No, it doesn't mean that. You know, Paul is writing about his inability to do uh, to the extent his heart is longing for. In verse twenty-two, we saw he his heart is delighting in God's law. and he has the standard before him the the law of god which reflects the character of god himself paul is unable to do that because the new nature in us is 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 created by god is longing uh, to be like that but the struggle is real so this is again a christian reality and as we progress in our sanctification we we develop greater to sin and a craving for righteousness but the sin remains hence the conflict remains you know we, we we might get over certain sins we might be victorious in certain areas then we become more sensitive to other areas of sin in our lives the conflict continues you know 
if in our life we are not sensitive to our sins, we don't have this conflict, I think we are in danger. We might be too much desensitized to sin. So that is one caution that uh, this text is giving, giving us. And uh, again, before verse 20, uh, going to verse 24, let's look into verse 21, the second half. Uh, it says, so I find it to be law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. This is again a Christian reality, the reality of a believer. You know, evil lies close at hand, battling us, fighting us. You know, battling every thought, battling every end of ours, battling every motive of ours, battling every intention of ours, battling every word that comes from our mouth, every deed, every act. The sin, this remaining in us is battling to get hold of that. It is very close. We know that even when we when we are about to do the most sanctified of all things, maybe prepare for a sermon. Ambitions can be evil. This, this sin is so real in us. And Paul breaks down into verse 24. If the first three was a lament, verse 24 is, is wailing. You know, a wail that exceeds all those laments. It says, Wretched, wretched, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? You know, the uh, old uh, Bible commentator by name Robert Haldane, he says, this is his quote, uh, Men perceive themselves to be sinners in direct proportion I previously discovered the holiness of God and his law. Let me repeat. Men perceive themselves to be sinners in direct proportion as they have previously discovered the holiness of God and his law. The more we understand the holiness of God and his law, the more we perceive ourselves as the sin reality becomes more ugly and tormenting and we, you know, this, this wretchedness comes all the more. Shall we read? Uh, uh, yeah, I think we have time. Uh, I think we, um, there is a, um, Psalm 119 uh, taking verses from that. It's a beautiful Psalm regarding the word of God. The psalmist delight word of God. Let's quickly take a take a scan through a number of verses. A quick scanning through Psalm 109. Verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. When we read through this these verses, uh, I want all of us to keep, uh, think about David and his heart. You know, Bible calls him a man after God's own heart. Blessed are those whose ways is blameless, whose walk in the law, who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word? Verse 10, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart that I not sin against you, Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it uh, to the end. Verse 33. Continuing, verse 57, the Lord is my portion, promise to keep your words. You know, when we, when we read this, you know, we think, oh, what a holy man, what a righteous man, what a sanctified man. Verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. What a perfect man. 143. Tried anguish have fun, but your commandments are my delight. Even in the midst of trouble and anguish, this man is delighting in God's commandments. What a man of God. And, and very notably and interesting, the last verse, verse number 173. I don't know how many of us have noted this verse. It ends in a totally different way. It says, 
David says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commands. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. I believe this is uh, an Old Testament parallel of uh, Romans uh, chapter 7, back to Romans 7. You know, just like Paul here, David, he delights in law. He is, he is fighting the spiritual battle of keeping the commandments. But it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. I hope we are able, we, all of us are able to un, uh, appreciate the parallel that is that we see here. And Paul is taking out wretched man that I am, verse 24. Shall we again go to another Psalm, Psalm 38, a few verses. I want all of us to uh, pictureize this and, and think about our own lives. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have come to me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning. And so on and on. Psalm 38. Just like Paul. Again, man after God, this reality of conflict with the remaining sin, dwelling sin. And the second half of verse 24 and back to Romans 7, it says, Who will deliver me from this body of death? The phrase body of death, that has a background to it. You know, it is said that, uh, I'm sure all of us know that Paul is coming from a place called Tarsus. And uh, near Tarsus, there is a of people and custom there, there. They have a very severe form of punishment for murder. So when the, when the, when the, when the guilty is caught, and when the murderers prove, what they do is they take the, the body, the dead body, the corpse of the one murdered, and tie that tightly onto the, onto the guilty person, onto the murderer. You know, face to face, chest to chest, uh, thigh to thigh, tied together. And the murderer walks... Uh, Bearing this body of death. That is the usage that Paul has in his mind. You know, that is the background to that usage. You know, who will deliver me from this body of death that I carry? You know, that rotting flesh that is tied together tightly, you know, to that murder. Until that rottenness spreads onto that fully alive human being and, and heat. That was the punishment. And Paul is saying, who will deliver me from this body of death? And Romans 8, I believe, is, is Paul's formula for victorious Christian. Or Paul describing how and when and where we will have this victory. Shall we quickly go on to a few verses? Uh, Romans 8. Paul is asking, where, where will we have deliverance? Who will deliver us? Romans 22 and 23. For we, the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Let's read verse 23 again. Not only the creation, we ourselves are groaning. As we wait eagerly for adoption as time, the redemption of our bodies. Three points to be noted. We groan inwardly. Yes, we are groaning. Just like we wait eagerly. Again, verse 23. For what? For the redemption of our bodies. 
the inner man the the core being of us need no redemption is already removed already redeemed but our, our flesh the body that we carry the body of death that we carry that is fleshy needs redemption continue continuing romans uh, 8 verse 29 and 30 what so what where, where is the deliverance verse 28 i am sure all of us know all things work together for the good of those who are called and those who love god and verse 29 says for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be formed to the image of him, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers yes we might morning but remember we are predestined to be conformed into the image of the son of god this body of death will be removed and verse says he is he is stretching all through history even before the foundations of the world we were predestined and says and those whom he predestined he also called those whom he called he also justified and those whom he justified he also glorified paul is not saying will be glorified paul is so sure he says is glorified thanks be to the lord jesus christ that is our victory only in christ we will have victory we'll have victory when he comes and when we will be glorified uh, a few more verses and we'll close for today first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 verses uh, 42 onwards so is it so is it with the rest of the dead what is so is perishable what is raised is imperishable it is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory just you know, paul is talking about this body of death sown in honor but it will be raised in glory it is sown in weakness it is raised in power verse 44 it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body if there is a natural body there is also a spiritual body verse 51 continuation of the same verse 51 to verse 57 same chapter verse 51 57 behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed who shall deliver me from this body of death we shall be changed for this perishable body was 53 must put in perishable and this mortality must put on immortality when the perishable puts on the perishable and the mortal puts on immortality then shall come to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory o oh, death where is your victory o oh, death where is your sting verse 56 verse 56 please the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law i hope you are getting with romans no death is sin and the power of sin is law where o death is free but thanks be to god who gives us victory through our lord jesus christ just like verse 25 in romans 7 7 in first corinthians 15 but thanks be to god who gives us victory through our lord jesus christ and verse 58 says therefore my beloved brothers be steadfast be immovable always abounding in the lord knowing that in the lord your labor is not in vain you know dating this conflict that we have is not in vain let us be steadfast in our faith and meanwhile was coming back to us 25 what is paul saying thanks be to god through jesus christ we will have the victory but meanwhile i am a meanwhile there so then i myself serve the law of god with my mind but with my flesh i serve the law of sin paul is saying yes i will have victory when christ comes when i will be glorified but until then i will live in life in christ and also in this body of death bearing this body of death i will fight i might fall 
but I will not give up my fight. I will get up, I will repent, I will fall on to the gospel that saved me. That's my only hope. I will cling on to Christ who justifies me. The justifying work of Christ, I will go back and hold on to and I will continue my fight with the power that he gives through the Holy Spirit. And more of that fighting and overcoming sin to come in, in the subsequent sessions of Romans 8. And let this reality, uh, you know, learn today. Let it, uh, you know, we should not take it as a license to say, oh, the sin, why fight? No. If we think like that, we don't have the, the real I in me is not real. Let's, let's kind of fight. Because we have victory in Christ. May the Lord bless us in our, in our, our spiritual warfare. Shall we, shall we bow down and close our eyes? Father, thank you and praise you for your word. Father, thank you for making us this, uh, this new creation. Thank you for causing us to be born again. Thank you for putting your spirit in us so that we're able to, to resist the evil, to we'll be able to resist the sin that is in us. We will be able to put up a fight. Father, help us not be people who give up, who surrender, seeing the glory of the enemy's territory, seeing the pleasures that, is, that we have uh, in, into the enemy. No. But rather help us be people who are gospel centered, who are God centered, who love certain things and hate things in agreement with the word of God. Help us be people who delight in God's law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.